developed this kind of approach, which we call TAR TLC3. We actually developed this in California over a protracted research um, center we had with them. The secret to giving a positive stigma is contact, is meeting people with serious mental illness. And it needs to be targeted, local, credible, and continuous. Is targets, is, you know, everybody in the room, we'd like to wave our magic wand now and get rid of stigma, but it's not going to happen. And it hasn't happened in the United States in gender. It hasn't happened in race. And so what's more important is to be strategic about it and focus on targets. And so again, um, Advocates in the room know some of the most important issues for people with lived experiences. They want to get back to work, and so you need to target employers, or they want to have fair share for living in good housing. So you target landlords, or good health care, or educational opportunities, or heavens to Betsy, you want the legislature, legislature to fund us the way we are due. Um, it needs to be local. When we rolled this program out, we actually rolled it out um, at the WPA meeting in Ottawa, which is in Canada. Um, for any of you who may not be aware, um, Canadians pretty much look at Americans as the Antichrist, and so anything that we come up with doesn't have a lot of credibility for them. I'm going to give you a quick um, American geography lesson. I'm from Chicago, and so we're in Illinois. Um, if you see that blue coming down, that's Lake Michigan. That's Illinois. And so, oh, there we are. And so um, Chicago is at the top of the state of Illinois. Um, that's about 500 miles. It's a big state. While Chicago is about half the population of Illinois, the other half is farmers. And so things that come out of Chicago have absolutely no credibility. As a matter of fact, in the middle of Chicago is a city called Peoria. And there's an expression in the United States that does the play in Peoria. Because if it does not, then it's not going to go anywhere. Or alternatively put, if you can develop a program in Peoria, Peorians need to do it. But even more, you know, a city by no means in Chicago is a homogeneous place. I mean, it's made up of different ethnic groups and different socioeconomic classes and the like. We've done research in Chicago for about 25 years. One of the things we've discovered is we have two independent African-American communities. Um, one's on the south side, one's on the west side. They have their own church I'm in the black community, of course, church organization is a big thing. Totally separate church organizations. Um, Chicago, I hear, I hear the EU's this way too. Chicago is a political place, so they have their own representatives and the like. And so if you're going to develop something on the west side with black people, you better make sure west siders are leading the challenge. Good, good stigma change is also credible and continuous. Credible. Um, I've done a lot of work with our Department of Defense and our Veterans Administration. I have not been a veteran, so I do not have a lot of credibility for them. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a huge issue with uh, veterans coming back from those dumbass wars that we had all this time. As a result of that, stigma is keeping people out of pursuing treatment. And so if you're going to be successful, you need to Army talks to Army, Navy talks to Navy, and Marines are better than everybody else. And so you better make sure people from the same branch of the service are presenting. And continuous. One time is good. Meeting Bob Lundin once is great, but carbon copies are not enough, which has led us, led a lot of people to understand what the grand plan is, what, what the atomic bomb is for erasing the stigma of mental illness. And you can learn what the atomic bomb is by understanding what happened in the gay community. In the United States, 40 or 50 years ago, extremely brave gay men, lesbian women, bisexuals came out. Um, again, 40 or 50 years ago, you come out, you lose your job, you get beat up. Um, and they came out. And as a result of that, my children were blessed with being brought up in an atmosphere where they didn't understand the homophobia that my generation lived with. I mean, by the time they got to school, they had a gay uncle, they had gay teachers, we had a gay minister. They knew this because those people were out. And so similarly, if people with mental illness come out, it's going to be a major barrier, a major barrier, a major booster to erasing the stigma of mental illness. And you know why it works exponentially better than reading a book? Is in gay people, my stereotype about gay people is that you're all perverts or you're all gonna, you know, be slinky or you're all gonna have weird hair or you're all, and meeting somebody tears it down in the flesh. And so mental illness is the idea that we're all unstable or we're all unpredictable or we're all drool and meeting people breaks it down. Meeting one person is great, but when you start meeting 
a bunch of gay people and realize that all of this is just not true. And then on top of that, you build human relationships with them. That's what tears down the stigma. And so people have come out. In the United States, several famous people come out. I love showing the slide. These are famous people in the United States coming out. And my students go, who are these people if they're famous? Um, Rod Steiger won the Academy Award for In the Heat of the Night. Patty Duke, some of you may know, um, actually passed away in the last month, won the Academy Award for Helen Keller. Mike Wallace was a, was a journalist on TV. But more recently, and these are ones my students gave me, Demi Lovato, um, Jim Carrey, um, you can see I'm really good at this, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, usually they give me cheat sheets, are all people who've come out with various disorders. And the idea is, is that famous people coming out is a good start. But there's a limit to the effect famous people can have. And it's what we call the Thurgood Marshall effect. Thurgood Marshall is the first African American Supreme Court judge in the United States, appointed in the 1960s. And when he was appointed, progressive people said, wow, whites will look at him and say, he's a black man, he's cool, black people must be OK. But it doesn't work that way. We compartmentalize. We say he's not like other black people. Or we say John Nash is not like other people with mental illness. I mean, heck, John Nash is a Nobel laureate. He's not like anybody. But that said, people from movies of the beautiful mind, it's a good movie, but it doesn't translate well towards changing stigma. What translates well is when the quote unquote average person came out. This is our Martin Luther King Jr. of mental health in the United States. Clifford Beers, who in 1903 to 1905 was in a state hospital for mental health problems. 1903 to 1905, could you imagine what the public thought about him then? For mental health problems, came out, started what was called the mental hygiene movement, has morphed into Mental Health America. Um, his idea, he said back there, is that we must fight in the open. And so we've been very interested in how the average person, the man and woman we live with and share with come out and wrote a book, I think you may have seen the flyers in the back, called Coming Out Proud. Um, it's a book um, with 37 people who have come out and told their stories. Um, Nicholas is in the middle. Um, for those of you who are going to be here Monday with uh, Honest, Open, Proud, um, John Larson's the guy on the motorcycle on the lower right. He's actually a very nice guy, even though he drives a motorcycle. And this is an, this is an attempt for average people to come out. And so we developed this program called Coming Out Proud to erase the stigma of mental illness. It actually started in 2001 when Bob, remember Bob Lundeen? Bob Lundeen and I wrote a uh, book in 2001 when I met Peter. <coughs> in the book, we outlined the idea of what it means to come out proud. Um, it's interesting, is pride an appropriate word for this? I mean, when I think about the mental health challenges I've had and being in the hospital and the like, what accomplishments do I have? I mean, despite those challenges, I've been able to make it and get some degrees and have some professors in front of my name. But overcoming my challenges has been significantly greater accomplishment for this than anything else. Let's be clear, though. I don't suggest pride. It's just a matter of meeting some sort of external criteria uh, accomplishments, so you should be proud. Anybody who's in recovery, anybody who is hopeful, anybody who's pursuing their goals, whatever they might be, are in the game, are trying to accomplish, have reasons to be proud. But on top of that, it's also an issue of identity, of who I am. For example, I'm Irish American, which, by the way, if you lived in the United States and you wanted to bless your, bo your boy child, you should name them Patrick. Because on March 17th, we do not have to buy a drink. Uh, Irish American is a big thing. It's nothing I've done to earn any kind of accomplishment, but it's part of who I am to be an authentic person. And I feel compelled and fun to talk about that. But I similarly feel compelled to talk about my mental health challenges more than, for example, physical health challenges I've had or, or my father who's a wonderful guy or, or my uh, German roots, oddly, oddly enough, um, because it sort of marked me. And so this being proud and coming out can have a big effect on people, which has led to this, which has been very well received. 